He's been called one of the most wanted political fugitives of 2018, as former Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili faces possible extradition to his home country from his new country, Ukraine. I'll ask him if he's prepared for life behind bars. And later, I'll talk to Ilhan Omar, the Somali refugee turned US politician, about life in Trump's America. Mikhail Saakashvili, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, you were twice elected president of Georgia and governed there for nine years. And yet you're now a wanted man in Georgia. You've gone from president to fugitive. Uh, how does that feel? No, I mean, I finished my presidential term and I finished it uh, with quite a record. <clears throat> we, uh, you know, Georgia has been the most spectacular reform transformation case in this part of the world. But then we had the government after peaceful transition, first ever peaceful transition in this region, which from the very beginning said our main one of my main goals is to indict Saakashvili on no matter what. So in the end, they said, let us look for at least something. And finally, they uh, gave me a sentence for presidential act of pardon, uh, for pardoning prisoners. Well, uh, that's the only case in modern world when president had been tried, not for corruption, not for uh, other abuses, but for right Hold on. pardon. I Hold on, it wasn't the pardon, it was the cover-up that they alleged was associated with the pardon. Oh. But just for the benefit of our global audience, you could face up to 11 years in prison in Georgia for multiple charges dating back to your presidency there, including abuse of power. You've already been sentenced to three years behind bars. Earlier this week, an appeals court in Ukraine uh, rejected your request for protection against extradition to Georgia. You're in Ukraine right now. It does look like you're on your way to prison, doesn't it? Regardless of what, how how accurate you think the charges are? I have to say, nobody in Georgia is expecting me. Georgian government, if, despite their formal an uh, announcements, are very scared that I, if I ever uh, get extradited to Georgia, then they will be just wiped out by unhappy populace we, where their the present government is extremely unpopular. And uh, I am a creator of modern Georgian state. We have very strong support among the people but also okay you, you among, say you uh, have support. you say you have a lot of support amongst the georgian people we'll come back to that in a moment but before we do just to be clear is it correct to say that as of now as of today this week you are currently a stateless person because you gave up your georgian citizenship in 2015 to pursue a career in politics in ukraine and then last july you were stripped of ukrainian citizenship for allegedly uh, providing false information on your registration form so you're neither ukrainian nor georgian right now yes Formally, I'm a stateless person, but uh, I'm appealing uh, in the courts, and it's an ongoing case, to get my citizenship back. Of course, under present legal system in Ukraine, there is a slim possibility I can do that because uh, the uh, president certainly is in control of the courts, and for him it's a very, very important you, case. You, but you, uh, you've eventually had, you, when there's... You've had this big row. Power. You mentioned the president. You've had this big row with President Poroshenko of Ukraine, who is a former friend and ally of yours. But just on this issue of you being in Ukraine, you're sitting in front of... A Ukrainian flag. What made you, a former president of one country, Georgia, move to another country, Ukraine, and try and become prime minister of that country? Many would say that's pretty unpatriotic of a former president of Georgia to do. First of all, there are historic presidents. Uh, Simon de Bolivar, there was such a great historic figure, was president of uh, or leader of five Latin American countries. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if Ukraine fails, if Ukraine breaks up, if Russia is victorious in Ukraine, then Georgia, is, which is 10 times smaller, will just might disappear from the map. That's one big motivation I have. Second, I already had spent 13 years of my adult life in Ukraine. And I've been uh, not only a participant of two Ukraine Maidan, two Ukrainian revolutions or uprisings. I was one of their organizers, arguably at least of the first Maidan. So I, I've been I have, I'm heavily invested by emotionally in Ukraine, and I have strong links to this country. And, uh, and also I have people here. You say you have you say you have strong links with the country, important. but Ukrainians don't seem to support you. A poll last December by the International Republican Institute showed that 75% of Ukrainians, three out of four people in that country, had either a somewhat or very unfavorable view of you. Why not just move on and let more viable, popular candidates run for office in Ukraine? You're not popular there. Look, look, look. look. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, the president of Ukraine, according to the same poll, is even more unpopular. Second, if you look at the poll numbers, 
every Ukrainian politician is doing rather bad. And uh, that's the that's the political crisis in this country that basically the entire political class is hated. Your party also was actively. polling at 1% at the end of last year, your no. Ukrainian party, the Movement of New Forces. No, 1%, different. President Saakashvili. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Between 1% and 7 and 8%, depending upon the polls. Second, President's party is not falling much better either. The problem is that the entire political spectrum needs to be reshuffled and needs to be changed. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. I stand up for the idea of uh, modernized, democratic, European, uh, Ukraine with open economy, free of oligarchs, free of corruption, because corruption is killing the economy. And if, you, if, you, yeah. uh, if the economy is being killed, if Ukraine doesn't get that double digit growth, okay. it will just disappear. The, your whole the entire region will become a mess. You, you said earlier in and the interview that the, you said earlier in the interview that the criminal charges against you in Georgia are all politically motivated. They're made up, and yet you also face criminal charges in Ukraine, where you are right now. In fact, you were supposed to come to a studio uh, to do this interview, but I believe you were so worried about being arrested, we've had to do this via. Skype, isn't it a problem for you that wherever you go, whether Georgia, Ukraine, you're being accused of crimes? The Ukrainians don't want to arrest me to try me. I told them, if you want to try me, try me. Because there is no evidence of any crimes I've committed here. No, they don't want to try me. They want to expel me from the country. They want to get rid of me. And that's an entirely different game. And the reason why they want to get rid of me is that because they don't have real case against me, because I really uh, cross the path of oligarchs that want to further plunder the country. The country is potentially the wealthiest country in Europe because of resources. And right now it's the uh, poorest country in Europe, GDP-wise, GDP -wise, because seven oligarchs hold hostages the entire wealth of the country. And they hold so, and I'm there, and they regard me as their main enemy. So, so you say you're the enemy no of the oligarchs, and yet sure. you quit as governor of the corruption ridden Odessa region in southern Ukraine after just 18 months in 2016 without really making any dent in reducing that corruption or going after those oligarchs. And in fact, back in Georgia, one of the main charges against you relates to massive embezzlement of public funds by you. Wait a minute. Let's go to Georgian charges. It, 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 not public funds, but presidential office expenses. The fact that they couldn't find any personal benefit from me, no personal account, no personal wealth, which is extremely rare in this region where everybody steals, like everybody steals. And we were the only case where absolute president had zero. I came with the same amount of wealth uh, or, or whatever assets and left with the same ones. I've never been rich and I'm not rich now. I'm even poorer now than I was before presidency. So Foreign if gas, you're so innocent, have... why not go back to Georgia and make the case that you're making to me in a court in your own former country, which you ran for nine years? Because European Court of Human Rights clearly said that in Georgia. They use preliminary detention for political purposes. <laughs> oh, and come. Our former Mikhail Saakashvili, do you know how a... odd it is to hear you quoting the ECHR against your own country's court system? When Why you were point? president for nine years, yes. they criticized you and that court system. You locked up hundreds yes, of so. people. And you didn't have a problem with the Georgian but court I'm, system then. I'm, no, you I'm, locked up your own defense that. minister on charges of money laundering, extortion yeah. and abuse of power. Yes. European court never supported his case and uh, supported the government, first of all. Second, yes, I'm proud that we locked up corrupt officials of my own government. When I became president, the country was uh, absolutely corrupt and it was a failed state. When I finished my presidency, the state budget went up 11 times. Economy went up four times. Uh, Georgia became the ninth best place to do business in the world. Georgia is number 16 in terms of economic freedom index. When the with United respect, States that's nothing 18. to do with what I asked about the judicial system. Uh, no, 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 no. It's all about f transparency. It's all about government. It's all about legal system. In fact, our judiciary is not ideal, and it's right now being controlled. It seized the control. The control was seized by biggest private uh, shareholder of Russian Gazprom, with clear goal to jail me. So the fact is that he had clear goal to put me in preliminary detention for many years without even trying me because this whole trial... No, no, about I understand your argument. All I'm asking is, do you understand yes. anyone watching this interview might find it odd that when you're accused of corruption by a Georgian court, you say it's all bias, but when you accuse others of corruption, you lock them up and you were criticised by only, human rights groups. Not only, not only I say it. The United States State Department said that charges were biased. The European Union said the same. Council but they also criticized the your arrests of people. You were criticized by the ECHR yes. in 2011 when you were president. You were criticized by Human Rights Watch. You were criticized by Carnegie and various so groups. What? So what? So what? We what makes you a hypocrite? So what? No, I'm sorry. I don't accept this. I, That's I what many would say, looking at the double standard. No, no, no. I think you should select your words more carefully because World Bank wrote a, letter, wrote a book when it said that the only case of successful transformation worldwide in the Georgia was world's number one 
perform a, a reformist country okay. under the I'm not, I'm, I haven't questioned... No, okay. Wait a minute. You told me I locked up people. We locked up criminals. Georgia That's... was one of the most criminal ridden countries in the world. You say you locked up... World. Okay, you say you locked up it's criminals. Not... You say you locked up yeah, criminals, right? Um, the ICG, the International Crisis Group, said that you, they were worried about your increasingly authoritarian behavior. Human Rights Watch said your government forces use violent, excessive force to disperse peaceful demonstrations in the capital. Uh, the International Committee to Protect Journalists pointed out that you shut down two television channels. These are not all criminals, Mikhail Saakashvili. No, of course not. And I tell you, there was one rally when it was organized on Putin's money, and everybody knows that. Our security forces were not ideal, and we couldn't have turned Georgia into liberal democracies in eight years' time. But non-existing country was turned into a best reform example in Eurasia. No country, no country had increased its credentials so well in nine years' time. And this is a well-known fact. That's why I was invited to Ukraine. That's why we, I feel strong support among best young people, among young reformers, among okay. well-educated Ukrainians as well as Georgians. That's how I feel it. You mentioned Vladimir Putin. You're best known in the West and the wider world for being president of Georgia in 2008 when your then country went to war with Russia. And in just five days, nearly 1,000 people died, more than 100,000 people were displaced. An exhaustive 1,000-page report commissioned by the European Union published in 2009 ultimately blamed Georgia. They blamed you, not Russia or Putin, for having started that war. Uh, many would say, therefore, yes. you have blood on your hands. It's totally fake. They never blamed us, and especially not unilateral in us, what they said is that Russian troops were first to enter Georgian territory. And indeed, our military response to other countries' troops entering my territory, our territory, was regarded as the date of with, start of the war. With and respect, so they, what? they didn't so, say that at all. Let, let, I've got the report or, quotes here. They said it was yeah. Georgia. This is the diplomat who led the investigation. It was Georgia which triggered off the war when it attacked uh, Shinkivali in South Ossetia yeah. with heavy artillery. Okay. It could not be verified that Russia was on the verge of a major attack, as you claimed. That's what the report says. Don't. No, no, wait. Before that, read it very carefully. They said Russian troops were, we confirmed, they were already inside the ter Georgian territory. And then, what you, your quote is well. But when My quote as well. The quote says it was Georgia which triggered off the war. That's you. You triggered a yeah. war that killed no, almost 1,000 people. Wait a minute. They already entered. When they enter your territory, you respond. I would see that any president who doesn't respond to foreign army entering this territory is a traitor. Any president who doesn't use military force when you are being attacked is a traitor. The report and says you overplayed your hand and you acted in the heat of the moment with heavy no, artillery. That's, that's, for God's sake, 100 times smaller country was invaded by 100 times bigger... Um, uh, uh, enemy. We were attacked and bombed by 200 Russian planes. We were attacked by 100,000 people army, and you didn't want us to even resist. The report what are you said, the, no, I'm not me. I'm no, quoting the EU. Yeah. I'm quoting an EU Commission report which says no, open no, hostilities no. began with a large-scale Georgian military operation. The question is whether it was justifiable under international law. It was not, says the report. Those are not my words, Mikhail Zakhishvili. That's the well, words of an independent report commissioned by the one, EU. One expert, and we have overwhelming evidence that we it were... It wasn't one expert, it was several, at, several experts. And we were, responding, we were responding, and it's sometimes there is also people who like to blame the victim. When you don't want to help the victim, they say, well, you know, it's the victim behavior as well. I'm sorry. We so were you believe the we Swiss didn't. diplomat who led the investigation was biased against Georgia? Well, I, I believe that we, the facts are very stubborn. We were entered, we were attacked. You cannot be blamed for being attacked. We were attacked, and this is the fact of life. We, pro we protected our sovereignty. They went towards our capital. They couldn't enter our capital because the United States intervened, because our army was heroic, because uh, six president the leaders of European countries came and stood under the Russian bombardments with our people, in this situation, just to be clear, and they physically protect the country. Just to be clear, no one. Very proud of that. Just to be clear, no one on this show country. or in this interview is defending the Russians or Putin. And the report criticizes Russia exactly. very heavily. You're right about that. But Good. it does say that you started the war in defiance of international law. You can reject it's that clear, conclusion, right? but that's what the report says. Don't shoot the messenger. Look, I would see any country that is being entered by internal force, and then somebody says, "We violate international." I'm sorry, but I'm an international lawyer. I'm a human rights lawyer. Okay. Right now, just before we finish, right now you have neither Ukrainian nor Georgian citizenship. So what's next for you, Mikhail Saakashvili? Where are you going to be a year from now, two years from now? 
I'll be uh, fighting together with people of Ukraine and Georgia against uh, Vladimir Putin's influence here for liberation of our country's territory from Russian enemies, uh, from Russian uh, hostile armies, but as well as from domestic oligarchs and corrupt elements that seize power in our countries and are killing prospects for our population. I think Ukraine will become superpower of Europe and Georgia will be again, once again, the shining example of success and the reforms worldwide, as it was under my leadership. Mikhail Saakashvili, thank you for joining me on Upfront. Thank you for inviting me. Hers is a remarkable journey from a refugee camp in Africa to a state legislature in the United States. In 2016, Ilhan Omar became the country's first elected Somali-American lawmaker. Last year, Time magazine put her on the front cover, calling her one of the women who are changing the world. So does the future of the U.S. look more like her or Trump? She joins me now. Ilhan Omar, thanks for coming on Upfront. Uh, you were elected, aged just 33, to the Minnesota House of Representatives in November 2016. Um, that was, of course, the same night that Donald Trump was elected president of the U.S. How did you feel that night? Was it a happy night for you, a sad night, a bit of both? I think it was bittersweet. Uh, I, I joked with um, my campaign staff and campaign supporters that we stayed uh, a little too long at our party um, <laughs> because we there was a lot of crying and a lot of people who were upset. But when the reporters asked me how I was feeling, I told them that I was actually optimistic and hopeful um, because I believed that this was going to be the awakening of our nation. People were going to um, be woke, awoken from their complacency and we were actually going to get to work in, in not only resisting but reshaping and restoring this country promise. And within just a few days of taking office, President Trump brought in his infamous travel ban, the Muslim ban. Um, you're not just a Muslim immigrant to the United States, you're a former Muslim refugee who's from one of the countries on the banned list, Somalia. Mm -hmm. So do you think President Trump doesn't want people like you in the country? Because he says it's not personal, it's national security. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if, if, if we were really being honest about what could be masqueraded as um, a national security issue. We know that no one from any of these countries has ever posed a threat um, within this country. And so uh, we know that for, for, for him uh, and, and his supporters, uh, this is just a political football and, and they're using um, our, our communities and, and, and people who, who look like me as, as leverage. You talk about him and his supporters. Uh, more than a million people in your state of Minnesota voted for Trump. He only lost that state, I think, by a percentage point and a half. Uh, do you feel cut off, disconnected from a lot of your own constituents who clearly don't see Trump's Islamophobia or anti-immigrant rhetoric as disqualifying? I mean, I think what we are seeing in Minnesota is people actually coming to terms with um, the, 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 the kind of rhetoric that they thought um, was just that rhetoric uh, now actually becoming policy. Um, I don't think a lot of Minnesotans and a lot of the people in this uh, country actually thought that he would implement. They, they, they voted because there was that economic anxiety. They believed this guy was going to be part of uh, negotiating this country into better um, really economic was, situation. You really think it was economic anxiety, not cultural or racial anxiety yeah, that drove I, them I, to I, I don't pull think, the lever for Trump? I don't think a lot of people understood that the, the ones, the people that he was talking about, the policies that he was talking about on the campaign trail were going to have an effect on, on, on the members of their community, the people that they have grown to, to appreciate to be part of their communities. When you hear reports of your president referring to countries in Africa, including your own country of birth, Somalia, as S-hole countries, do you think that makes him a racist? Is Donald Trump a racist in your view? I mean, I think there isn't a debate about whether um, Trump is a racist. Um, I think he, he, he fits into every, every ism. <laughs> um, uh, but but what, what is important is for people to actually understand the implication um, of, of those kind of descriptions that he attaches to countries 
um, in, in Africa, in Haiti, in El Salvador, uh, when we are having a conversation about what will ultimately make our country safe, it is about showing strong and principled leadership. It's about um, being the, 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 the country that, that has been known to, to, to foster open and inclusive societies. But you say there's no debate about whether Trump's a racist, and a lot of people would agree with you on that. And in fact, there's been an explosion in the number of anti-Muslim, far-right, white nationalist groups in the U.S. over the past couple of years. Your own state of Minnesota experienced a record number of anti-Muslim incidents in 2016. Um, you yourself, I believe, just a few weeks after your election victory, I think you had a cab driver uh, call you filthy and ISIS and threaten to remove your hijab. How much do you hold Trump and the rise of Trump responsible for this explosion of U.S. Islamophobia? Oh, I would actually come very short of, of holding them exclusively responsible um, for, for the rights. I think when you demonize um, and dehumanize, uh, it is easy for people to, 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 to commit acts of violence um, against those, those individuals because they no longer see them um, as, as a person, as someone who, who has feelings, who's worthy of respect. Um, and, and I think that is where we are moving away from the idea that we, we are supposed to be a, a welcoming nation. A lot of conservatives in particular would say that the rise in Islamophobia is a result not of hate, but a fear, a legitimate fear, they say, of quote-unquote jihadist terrorism, whether it's Fort Hood or San Bernardino or the recent truck attack in New York. Uh, what do you say to them? I would say uh, uh, our, our country should be more fearful um, of, of, of white men across our country, because they are actually um, causing uh, most of the deaths within this country. Um, and so if fear was the, the driving force of, of, of policies to keep America safe, Americans safe inside of this country, um, we should be uh, profiling, monitoring, um, and, uh, and, and creating policies to fight the radicalization of white men. But the, most of the funding and attention, even under Obama, obviously went towards Muslim communities. One of those communities is in Minnesota, uh, your state, the Somali-American community in Minnesota, where I think over the past few years, more than 20 young Somali-Americans have left uh, to go and fight for ISIL or Al-Shabaab or one of these quote-unquote jihadist groups abroad. That's a real threat, obviously. No one's pretending it's not a threat. So what do you do about it? But I mean, I think, it, it, like I said, it, the, the 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 focus of of our um, uh, policies uh, should should be about keeping Americans safe, keeping us domestically uh, safe, and 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 where we actually find a solution is looking at um, our our foreign policy, looking at how we are engaging with um, uh, these the the members of these these communities, uh, and 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 the kind of rhetoric, right, like that is being. Um, spewed out of leaders within our, our, our city halls, within our state capitals, and 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 within um, our our nation's capital. Some would um, say some would say that's true. There's some really bad rhetoric coming from uh, politicians, security leaders, etc. But there's also a lot of bad rhetoric coming from Muslim community leaders, imams, etc. Right. Is that fair? I think bo both of those statements could be true, and I th and I think you know it just goes to show what happens when you have uh, segments within communities um, that that are uh, using fear and hate um, to mobilize uh, their base, um, and, and, it, and it is important for us to actually have a conversation about what kind of communities we are trying to build and what this nation actually stands for. In an interview last year, you said your campaign for state office was about more than you. It was about shifting, quote, the narrative about what is possible. For those outside of the U.S., we have a global audience watching, who look at the current U.S. president, maybe think he defines the U.S. now, his anti-immigrant, anti-minority, anti-Muslim sentiment. Do you see your story as a kind of foil, a counter-narrative to that? Are you personally the anti-Trump? What, what I represent is 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 an America that that still allows people to to fulfill that American dream that you can come here at the age of 12 only knowing two phrases in English 
have the opportunity to put yourself through school and ultimately defeat a 44-year incumbent um, to win uh, a seat at the table, not only representing people that look like you, but uh, a district that has a 70 percent white population. What I wanted people to know throughout my election was that this dream isn't closed off to people, that the idea that a person of color or women could only win and, and run in districts that looked like them um, was, was, was something that we needed to move away from. Ilhan Omar, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.